Senator Cruz, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's, it's great to have the opportunity to join you. So let's get right into it. Uh, are you concerned about the threat of central bank digital currencies? And I assume the answer is yes. What are the specific risks that you see to America and civil society from CBDCs being rolled out? Look, I'm, I'm very concerned about the risk of a CBDC. Uh, Joe Biden, early in his presidency, issued an executive order directing the Federal Reserve to study creating a central bank digital currency. And the New York branch of the Fed is actively working on doing exactly that. Uh, I think that's exceptionally dangerous. We see China moving forward uh, with the intention of using a CBDC to destroy all the value of Bitcoin to destroy anonymity, to destroy decentralization. Their objective is precisely the opposite of a distributed ledger system. It is they want a centralized ledger that the government has complete visibility into and complete control over. And, and, and I think that is profoundly dangerous. I've introduced legislation to prohibit the Fed or the federal government from creating a CBDC. I don't want the government having control over your finances. And I, I think it is part and parcel with a view, if you look at, at last year, the Biden administration's top legislative priority, what they called Build Back Better, uh, what I called Build Back Broke, um, one element of it was a requirement that banks report every single transaction in excess of $600 to the federal government. Now, if you think about it, that means your rent payment every month. If you own a home, that means your mortgage payment every month. If you own a car, most car payments now are north of 600 bucks. It is literally the government having visibility on virtually every transaction you're making. That's their stated goal. I think it's a terrible goal. By the way, the same people that want a CBDC, they hate Bitcoin, and they hate cash. Let's be clear, they don't like cash for exactly the reason I like cash, because it is not subject to centralized control, it is not subject to constant surveillance. Uh, and so I hope we see growing resistance to a CBDC. I am very worried that we will see, even in the next couple of years, the Fed roll it out and not wait for Congress to act at a minimum before we did a CBDC, which, as I said, would be a terrible idea, but at a minimum, if we were to do it, it should be Congress making that decision, elected by the people, not Federal Reserve governors that have no accountability to the American people, uh, just by fiat decreeing a, 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 a new form of currency. I, yeah, I really appreciate that answer, and I think a lot of Americans on, on both sides of the aisle share that, that same fear. Well, let's move to Bitcoin. Uh, yep. How do you see this this network, this asset, uh, benefiting or advancing American strategic interests, particularly abroad? Yeah. Look, I am incredibly excited and incredibly bullish on on Bitcoin specifically, crypto more broadly, but Bitcoin in particular. Um, I think Bitcoin is clearly the alpha in the cri crypto sphere both in terms of coming first and, and also being clearly the most dominant. Um, I think the analogy of digital gold is, is powerful. Um, and the insight that led to its creation is still extraordinary. Um, listen, I'm, I'm a Bitcoin investor personally. Uh, I have a standing buy order. Every Monday morning I have a buy of Bitcoin that comes in. And I own a little more than two Bitcoins. So it's, it's uh, and every, every Monday I own a little bit more. Um, and I will say, I bought the dip, which, which I was quite happy with. But I'm also a long-term investor, so I'm, I'm fine with some volatility. And I recognize that it, there's going to be going ups and they're going to be going down. But 21 million is a number that is a, a firm number. And I, look, I think one of the attractions to Bitcoin, certainly for me, but for many, uh, is as a hedge against inflation. And particularly when you have irresponsible politicians in Washington that spend money like drunken sailors, uh, which is actually not fair to the sailors because at least they're spending their own money. <laughs> 
and that print trillions and trillions of dollars. We see inflation all across the country. That was driven by this spending binge that happened the last two years in, in Washington, and, and it unleashed significant inflation. I think Bitcoin is an, is an important check against that. I think it is also powerful in that it is decentralized, in that it is far less susceptible to government control. Um, listen, I like Bitcoin for the same reason that the Chinese Communist government doesn't like Bitcoin. They don't like Bitcoin and they banned it because they can't control it. By the way, I would note, and you guys asked me to be nonpartisan, but I'm just going to observe, China hates Bitcoin for the same reason Elizabeth Warren hates Bitcoin. <laughs> because they both want to control it. Um, and it comes down to fundamentally, do you want the government in charge of everyone's money? If the answer to that question is yes, then Bitcoin scares the hell out of you. And I'll point out, all right, one powerful illustration of that. If you all remember back during the COVID pandemic, uh, you remember in Canada, the truckers were protesting the vax mandate and you had Canadian truckers standing up and protesting and, and it captured the eyes of, of the world. And, and look, I, I was born in Canada. There's one thing Canadians are known for, which is being really, really nice. And you had Canadian protesters protesting loudly and not being nice. And you had Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, trying to crush them. And we saw initially people were raising money to support the, the truckers and doing it through GoFundMe. And then GoFundMe promptly shut it down and said, we're, we're going to control your money and not allow you. And then people started raising Bitcoin. And the Canadian government sent a letter to Nunchuck asking for, please give us their Bitcoin. And the response, if you have not read this letter, it's a beautiful letter. I'm just going to read part of it. So this is the, the, the letter that, that the Bitcoin company sent back to the Canadian government. We do not connect, collect any user identification information beyond email addresses. We also do not hold any keys. Therefore, we cannot freeze our users' assets. We cannot prevent them from being moved. We do not have knowledge of the, quote, existence, nature, value, and location of our users' assets. This is by design. Please look up how self-custody and private keys work. And then the letter ends with, when the Canadian dollar becomes worthless, we'll be here to serve you too. <laughs> yeah, I think the... the politicization of, of banking is a terrifying concept. Uh, no offense. I don't want anybody in Washington deciding what I can spend my money on. I agree. Uh, and so to round things out, Senator Cruz, uh, you know, along with uh, Senator Lummis, who's also going to be speaking later this afternoon, uh, I think you are one of the more, one of the most knowledgeable uh, people in, in Congress, especially in the Senate when it comes to Bitcoin. So my last question is, what are the most common misunderstandings you hear about this technology? And, and what do you wish your colleagues uh, would understand about it? So look, there are a lot of misunderstandings. You may recall back uh, during the infrastructure bill, there's a provision there that seeks to reg regulate Bitcoin and crypto and to treat every Bitcoin miner as a broker dealer. And it was put in um, I stood on the Senate floor. I offered an amendment to strike that provision from the bill. Uh, and unfortunately, Bernie Sanders and the Democrats objected and wouldn't strike it. And the problem is, I still, to this day, we have 100 senators. I don't know that there are five senators who could tell you what a Bitcoin is. Like when you ask what my colleagues don't know, you know, Otto von Bismarck said there are two things you don't want to see being made. Sausage and legislation. <laughs> and in both instances, there are a lot of blood and guts go into it. Um, that provision was put into the bill with very few people having any awareness of what they were doing, of what the consequences 
would be, and actually if Treasury enforces that language vigorously, it has the potential to wreak utter havoc uh, for Bitcoin and, and crypto writ large. From my perspective, I'd say about two years ago, I started wanting to learn more. And, and look, it is true that I know more about this topic than many of my colleagues, but, but it is a standard. It's in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Um, I know less about Bitcoin than any person in this room. Um, and I recognize that. I will say one of the things that I've tried to do is repeatedly sit down with experts, sit down with people in the industry, sit down and have dinner with them and just talk, just ask them, okay, explain. I ask lots of dumb questions. I'm a big believer that, like, if you ask dumb questions, that is actually how you, you start to understand what's happening. That is not a typical approach on Capitol Hill. And so... Does there need to be a regulatory framework for Bitcoin and crypto more generally? Yes. But I think we need to proceed slowly because the potential for damage is enormous. And listen, one of the things, I want Texas to be an oasis for Bitcoin and crypto. I want everyone to come to Texas. I will say one of the things that's nice, Miami's fighting us. And that's good. I like competition. I want Miami to say, no, no, no. We're a more attractive place for Bitcoin than you are, and I want Austin to say baloney. And by the way, if you want to be mining Bitcoin, you want access to abundant and affordable energy, and, and there's no place in the world like Texas for that. Um, I also try to engage on a lot of issues on the energy front. Um, I view Bitcoin mining, among other things, as, as a means of enhancing the stability and resiliency of the grid that Bitcoin mining is essentially a battery, is a way of storing value because the grid has to match what's generated and what demand is, and we've got more and more mining going into Texas. But if you have a weather event, if you have a, a heat wave or you have a cold freeze and suddenly you need electricity, those miners in a fraction of a second can be shut off and free up massive amounts of power to heat people's homes or to cool people's homes. And that can be instantaneous, so it gives a, a reservoir of stored value. I also talk a lot about, if, if you're interested in alternative energy, one of the things Bitcoin mining gives the ability to do, wind and solar, inconveniently, the sun shines in a lot of places that are really distant and hard to access, and the wind blows in a lot of places that are really distant and hard to access, which means it can be unaffordable to set up solar panels or windmills if you don't have electricity transmission lines to carry the power to where people live. And what Bitcoin mining lets you do is set up one windmill in the middle of nowhere and have the ability to generate mining and value to make that first solar panel, that first windmill profitable. And as you erect more and more and more, at some point, the economics will support the transmission lines, but it gives the ability to make the investment in alternatives more profitable. So I think an energy story is a story the Bitcoin community needs to do a better job telling, because I think there are a lot of people in Washington who, you ask, what do they not understand? I think a lot of people think it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, I think a lot of people think, well, it just wastes a lot of energy, and so we shouldn't be doing any of this mining. And beyond that, there's just a general sense of we don't trust it because we can't control it. I think a lot of my colleagues think, well, if you're doing Bitcoin, you must be a drug dealer or doing money laundering because that's the only reason you want privacy over your financial affairs. And, and so I think we collectively need to tell a better story explaining the benefits. Uh, and, and that's certainly something that, that, that I'm trying to do. And that's what, exactly what we're trying to do with, with BPI. Thank you so much for your time and your insights, Senator. It's great to be with you.